Have you ever had a time in your life where you questioned your value? Thank you. (laughs) Or maybe have you had an experience where the benefits that you may have seen in yourself, you didn't really recognize and others. This is the start of where my journey began with the Paralympic Games. Now Paralympics are games for athletes with physical impairments and visual impairments. And they happen every two years on the Winter Games and the Summer Games right behind the Olympic Games. So it's the parallel games to the Olympics is what it really stands for for athletes with these physical impairments. And I use the word impairment rather than disabilities because disabilities tends to be a very negative word. Impairment is a little softer. And I think there are two things about what I was to discover that happens to individuals that either devalue or don't recognize the benefits in others. And in the Paralympic world or in the world of impairments, those two things are physical impairments and the intellectual impairments. So when there's a physical type of impairment, that's somebody that may have been using a wheelchair to get around. And they have a great interview that's about to come up. They've sent their resume in and they go into the interview place and the interview is actually on the third floor, but the, either the elevator is broken or there is no elevator at all and they can't make their appointment. They have the talent to get there, they just cannot physically get there. The other one, instead of the intellectual, is the attitudinal barrier. So you take that same individual and if the person that was to do the interview says, well, that's your problem, you should have been able to get up here or maybe that will impede you from doing your job, then we have another attitude problem based upon that person's revelation of what they've experienced in their life versus what this other person is trying to accomplish in theirs. And this is the mindset I was taking as I went down and started teaching a lot of groups, in this particular case, the United States Army, on how to incorporate injured servicemen and women, wounded and ill from either the battlefield, the 30% that are injured on the battlefield, or the 70% that are not, wounded, ill, and injured. And they were rehabbing in these warrior transition units. And the warrior transition units are about 35 across the United States. And as I was developing these programs, this program was a platform to use sport as a tool for their rehabilitation. This is where Paralympics actually came from. Individuals from World War II that were injured on the battlefield began using sport as a tool for their rehabilitation back in the 40s by a gentleman by the name of Sir Ludwig Gutmann in England. And I was fortunate enough to continue this legacy on. So now in 35 of our worry transition units, our injured, wounded, and ill service members are healing through sport. And a cadre course was going on down in San Antonio, and they took me down to San Antonio to help explain and incorporate these training techniques so that they could go back to those warrior transition units, these young men and women that were going to be the the leaders of the cadre to, to do these sports. And I would go down there and help them understand these physical limitations for the impairments and the attitudinal barriers. And it was very difficult because you have to put somebody in the mindset and have them wear the shoes of that service member who's been over in battle. Now, just picture this. Think about this for a minute. Our men and women who have served so valiantly have been going from basic training through their advanced individual training onto the battlefield for not one or two times, but sometimes seven and eight times. And as they're going, playing cards and having jokes and, and, and playing dominoes and all these games with their buddies, on one mission, something goes wrong. And now they're picking up the body pieces of their friends they were just playing cards with, putting them into a bag, 
going to Andrews Air Force Base as our men and women come back home. And that's the mindset of walking in somebody's shoes. And those that were not killed in the battle come back wounded, ill, or injured. And they go to Walter Reed's and the Brook Army Medical Centers in San Antonio, or they go to San Diego Medical Center out in, in, in San Diego in Balboa Hospital. And that's where they begin their healing process. And sport becomes one equalizer for them to jump back into a healthy and active lifestyle. And so to try to get them to understand what this process is like, having been an amputee, actually I still am an amputee myself, Getting them in the mindset of walking in their shoes for a day, I tell a story. And the story is this. I had just made the Paralympic swim team. I was a four-time All-American at the University of Arkansas, had a crippling injury going over hurdle after twice having been to the Olympic trials, which resulted in the amputation of my left leg. And I'm now finding myself on the Paralympic swim team sitting in the Dulles International Airport about to go to a test event, and I just didn't understand the value and benefit of being on this team. You see, I wanted to be an Olympic athlete, not a Paralympic athlete. And as I'm sitting there trying to understand the value and the benefits with my new teammates who are on the basketball team, the swim team, and the track and field team, I'm also sitting next to a gentleman who is in a three-piece Armani suit Gator skin shoes, who's talking so loud on his cell phone, I just wanted to get his throat and just choke him. <laughs> I didn't. But I went back in my stupor, and I'm trying to understand this, and he's not getting his first class upgrade, and I just don't want to hear this, and I got this other issues going on. What's the value and what's the benefit of being on this Paralympic team? The gate agent gets up with her perky self. Ladies and gentlemen, flight number 163 is now ready for passenger boarding. Will everyone who needs a little more time and assistance please get up and board the aircraft at this time? So 50 of my Paralympic teammates and I <laughs> got up and started going down a jet bridge. And I said, oh, benefit number one. <laughs> That's a perk. <laughs> so I get on board the aircraft, and I go to my seat, and I take my seat, I like this window seat, so I go over to the, seventh, uh, the 14th row, and I take seat 14F by the window. I like the window seat. And I'm watching this amazing process of my teammates boarding the aircraft. And some are going all the way to the back, and they're in, in their aisle chairs for the wheelchair users, and some are sitting up in, in, the, in the front, and, and the, the, the ones with cerebral palsy, they're kind of, Teeter tottering going down. I'm like, this is amazing. What a phenomenal product. How did I miss that? And of course, I didn't get on board the aircraft first. And as I'm watching all this with amazement, I see my basketball teammate, Tree. Now, Tree is a bilateral amputee. That means both legs are missing below his knees. But Tree stands six feet, eight inches tall. But I get it. Being a bilateral amputee, he can be a tree at 6'8", or a stump at 4'3", depending upon which legs he takes out of his closet in the morning time. So tree stops at the seat 7C, sits down in the seat 7C, pops his artificial legs off, hands them to the flight attendant, who then places them in the overhead bin. The flight attendant goes to Tree and says, sir, do you need any more time or assistance? Can I help you with anything else? And Tree says, no, I'm good, man. I'm good. It's all right. And she walks back up into the first class cabin to get all the ABs on board the aircraft. ABs for able to bodied. And as she goes, quick as a whip, he is now 4'3". Tree jumps into a seat, lifts himself into the overhead bin with his artificial limbs and closes the bin door. 14F. <laughs> I catch eyes with my friend Amy on my team, on the swim team. Amy darts her head down, turns beet red, 
puts her hands together, signaling like they have done this a thousand times before. Now I'm on the edge of my seat, trying to see what's gonna happen next, and people are filing to the back, and they're filing to the front, some in the first class, some in the back of the cabin, and I'm waiting to see who is gonna stop at that seventh row. And we have our winner, Mr. Armani Sue. <laughs> Still on his cell phone, still upset about that first class seat he did not get. I cannot believe you didn't give me the first class seat. I'm sitting in 7C? Seven, 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 no, 7B. Seven I'm in a middle seat. Are you kidding me? So he puts his attache case down. He's pulling his bag behind him. And obviously the bag will not fit underneath the seat in front of him. So he must go to the overhead bin where our friend Tree has been laying prone for the last five minutes. And when Armani goes to lift that latch, <laughs> don't get ahead of me now. <laughs> he goes to lift that latch and boom, out three pops. <laughs> Jump just like you did, man. Armani jumps from the seventh row back to the 14th row where I'm at. I catch eyes with Amy. Amy says, oh, that was pretty good, John. The last guy I made to row 10. New world record! <laughs> Armani picks up all his stuff, and he starts walking back up to seat 7C. And no joke, Tree is still laying there, but he has his little nubby legs crossed. He's got his hand on his chin. <laughs> and he says, I'm sorry, sir, but this overhead bin space has been filled. <laughs> Cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> and that's when I, it hit me. I started thinking to myself, how dare I devalue my teammates and not understand and recognize the benefit that they were bringing to me and to everyone around them. Each one of them just wanted to be treated with dignity and respect. So as I was thinking about that story, I used that back in that room down in San Antonio. Not only to get a little bit of a humorous laugh out of it, but to share with them that we have to change our mindset. We have to change some of the stereotypes that we have had in order to help somebody else come out of their impairment, of their limitation. Because they don't get it. They don't realize what life is all about. And one of the hardest things to do for an injured service member is to jump back into life. The first thing they want to do is go back to the battlefield. That's the first thing. But because they're healing together and once they realize that that might not be an option or possibility, they're looking for their identity. Who are they now? What can they do? And that cadre course, I tell them you are the individuals that are going to give them hope and life again, but you cannot feel sorry for them. Treat them with dignity and respect. So, the next time you board an aircraft <laughs> and you go to check the overhead bin, just be careful because you never know what life's overhead bin has in store for you. Thank you.